deconstructing the past to help you make sense of today. Time for another award-winning episode of Pre-Nicene Perspective with your host, Darren Kalama. They say that good things take time and great things take even longer. And such has been the case with the canonization of one of the most important and transformative figures in pre-Nicene Christian history. You see, within theological circles, he's known as the real-life Indiana Jones. And after almost 2,000 years, he's now known as a saint. But surprisingly, the odds are you've never heard of him. So transcendent and sweeping were his achievements and discoveries that the most preeminent biblical scholar and church historian, Adolf von Harnack, wrote about our newest saint, saying, and I quote, Christians owe to him the idea of a New Testament. It had occurred to no one before and can be best understood as originating in the context of his rejection of an Old Testament base for Christianity. Christians owe to him the particular form of the New Testament. The equal standing of the letters of Paul with the memoirs of Christ's life is something that would not be expected in a sacred literature from any precedent up to that time. Christians owe to him the prominence of the voice of Paul in the New Testament and, consequently, in subsequent Christian tradition. Christians owe to him the push towards a Christianity rooted in its own distinctive scripture, rather than in an oral tradition of interpreting Jewish scripture, or in a scriptureless system of authority and practice like most Greco-Roman religions of the time, unquote. Now, this is a powerful synopsis to be sure, but as you'll soon see in this episode, it barely scratches the surface. And the man we're talking about is Marcion of Sinope. And last week, on June 9th, he was canonized by the Marcionite Christian Church in Greece and is now known as Saint Marcion. The false libel of heretic washed away and now taking his rightful place among the holy luminaries. Bishop Andrew Theophilus recognized and honored St. Marcion at the ceremony with the words, quote, Although best known for compiling the first Christian Bible in 144 AD, it is his steadfast courage derived from the Holy Spirit against powerful forces that allowed him to prevail and show others our Christian God was only revealed to us through Jesus Christ, unquote. St. Marcion lived from 85 to 160 AD, and he was the son of the Bishop of Pontus, and successful in his own right as the motivated owner of a fleet of merchant ships, kept busy by ferrying grains and goods throughout the Roman Empire from his home port in Sinope on the southern coast of the Black Sea. And already we see the key elements that put this special man in a special place at a special time in history, and as we'll soon see, he was destined to do some very special things. But first some perspective. He was only a generation removed from those who would have talked with and met Jesus Christ personally. His father was a bishop, and his hometown was just a skip and a jump from Galatia. You know it today as Ankara, Turkey, and may also know it from Paul's epistle to the Galatians. And situated just a little bit farther to the south would be the city of Antioch, the Apostle Paul's base of operations where he rested between journeys establishing new churches across the Roman Empire. Now, given this, Marcion would have known all about the Apostle Paul and admired him like many others did, living in this region dominated by newly minted, salty Christians. But he wanted to know more, and he wanted to do more. You see, as a sailor and captain, Marcion kept log entries and lists in something called a codex. It's the forerunner to what we know today as books. You see, when you're on a windy ship, the last thing you wanted were bulky scrolls flying around all over the place. You wanted logs and entries nice and tidy, a place for everything and everything in its place. 
Now, knowing that Paul was a prolific writer and had many churches throughout the Roman Empire, Marcion decided to form an expedition to revisit every one of those churches, collect all of Paul's epistles written in Greek, and transcribe everything into the codex format. Now, he had the resources, the ships, and the crew to get the job done. In short, he was about to compile the world's first Christian Bible. And once again, we see God's hand in placing the right person at the right time in the right place. St. Marcion was uniquely qualified for this larger-than-life adventure. Now, you might be thinking he just loaded up the ships and sailed off into the sunset, but one look at a map and the cities named in Paul's letters, and we see that wouldn't have been the case at all. The journey would have started on land, heading southwest, and Marcion ships would have been instructed to meet him later at Antioch to complete the expedition with its final destination of Rome. Now, if you're listening to this on the Pre-Nicene Perspective podcast or on the FBN Radio Network, I'll have a link in the show notes with a map and route so you can follow along. Now, looking at that map, some of you might be thinking, uh, gee, Darren, I don't know. Look at all those cities scattered across so many different countries. I mean, did Marcion speak six different languages or something? How was he going to communicate with all those different people? Well, the short answer is he didn't need to. Because 400 years earlier, we find God's guiding hand at work again, this time through Alexander the Great and his rather benign conquering and Hellenization process, folding disparate cultures under one Greek tent. And under that tent, you spoke one language, Greek. And that means everybody within the Roman Empire, including Jews and Romans and everybody in Paul's scattered churches, spoke and wrote in Greek, uh, Koine Greek specifically. Okay, let's mount up. Our first stop is southwest to Ankara, where Marcion visits the Galatian church and picks up Paul's epistle to the Galatians. On your screen, you'll see the title of the epistle, and under that will be a prologue before the actual scripture begins. Each epistle has a prologue written by St. Marcion, which explains why Paul felt it necessary to write a letter to each of the named churches. Now, the scripture itself is left in situ and unchanged. The prologues are very helpful because they give us context and a feel for the individual circumstances and events of the day. Now, I should note that these prologues are only found in the first Christian Bible. They were removed when the Judeo-Christian Bible was stapled together and published by the Catholic Church in 382 AD. And it's also worth noting that the Vatican Library still references these prologues and the fact that their Greek source material for Paul's epistles came directly from Marcion of Sinope. I'll have a link in the show notes for radio listeners and others will see the Vatican Library documents themselves on their screen at this time. But hey, no rest for the weary. We need to saddle up again and head south, this time to Laodicea and Colossae. And it is in Colossae that we find the meeting house or home church that was the subject of Paul's epistle to Philemon. Colossae is the city where he lived. You see, in the pre-Nicene Christian era, it was common for people to celebrate mass in larger private homes. And now we head pretty much straight east to what you would call Paul's headquarters, the city of Antioch. Paul refers to this city in his epistle to the Galatians, in which he recounts his fight with Peter, also known as Cephas, and James. You see, these two were acting very much like the Judaizers or Judeo-Christians you find today, and they were badly in need of correction. In fact, we read about this in Galatians chapter 2, verses 7 through 10. Quote, James and Cephas and John, those reputed to be pillars, the right hands of fellowship they gave to me and Barnabas, that we should go unto the nations, but they unto the circumcision. But when Cephas came unto Antioch, I withstood him to the face, because he was to be blamed. 
For before that came James with the nations he was eating, but when he came he withdrew and separated himself, fearing them which were of the circumcision. And the other Jews dissembled likewise with him, insomuch that Barnabas also was carried away with their dissimulation." Unquote. Now, this clash between the Judaizers and Paul would culminate in the Council of Jerusalem in 48 AD, in which the 613 alien Hebrew laws were tossed to the curb. In fact, if it wasn't for Paul's intercession against these Judaizers, you'd still be making phlegmatic guttural noises and twirling magic chickens over your head during the new moon. Now, Antioch is also important because it's where St. Marcion would have acquired the original Gospel of the Lord. Now, you know it is the revelation, or his revelation, on the road to Damascus in 34 AD. And it is this Gospel that formed the cornerstone of faith for the pre-Nicene Christians. And we find Paul referring to it specifically in Galatians chapter 1, verses 8-9. through 9. But I certify you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached of me is not after man. For I neither received it of man, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. Unquote. And it is this, and only this gospel, that we find in that first Christian Bible of 144 A.D. Okay, now at this point our land and sea elements... Uh, join up, and the fleet sails west across the Mediterranean to Philippi, followed by visits along the eastern coast of Greece to the churches of Thessaloniki and Corinth. And it's interesting, is it not, that we read in these prologues of so many of these churches being subverted by false brethren, Judaizers, Jews, and false prophets trying to drag them back to the dark ages of the alien Hebrew laws. In fact, it's an attack that Paul addresses directly in Galatians 2.16. For if righteousness come by the law, then Christ died for nothing. Now, given the breadth of the geography involved in the testimony of Paul himself, one could easily make the case that this subversion was coordinated and targeted aided and abetted by the Judaizers slinking around back in Jerusalem, an inside job, if you will. Perhaps we'll address this in another episode. For now, though, it's time to weigh anchor and set sail for the final stop in this episode, Rome, 144 A.D. And in Rome, the showdown between St. Marcion and Pope Pius I would take place. Now, in many respects, it would mirror the conflict between Paul and the then-Judaizer Peter that took place nearly a hundred years earlier. It was grace versus alien law. But with one very important overarching difference, Marcion was going to take the argument to a whole new level. You see, after his expedition and acquiring and transcribing the very first Christian Bible for the first time, he was able to do something else for the first time, and that was to lay that Bible side by side with the Hebrew Torah, scriptures right next to scriptures, the words of Jesus and our Christian God next to the words of Yahweh, the deity worshipped by Jews. He read Ezekiel and Numbers, and it was all right there in black and white, this Yahweh deity commanding his worshipers to murder innocent women and children and to have virgins given to him as, and I quote, his share. And all the while, his worshipers engaging in human sacrifice and slavery, as we read in Judges and other writings found in their alien scrolls. And after this session of contrast and compare, Marcion came to the inescapable conclusion that whatever this Yahweh thing was, it had absolutely nothing to do with Jesus, the Christian God revealed to us only through him, and more importantly for purposes of our discussion, nothing to do with our Bible. Now, Marcion set these plain, undisputed facts right in front of Pope Pius and his entourage and said, you have a choice to make. You cannot drink from the cup of the Lord and the cup of the devil. You cannot eat at the table of the Lord and the table of the devil. Now, you could have heard a pin drop on the marble floor after Marcion's word had echoed off the walls. 
and like Peter and James before him, Pius chose poorly, and he took the easy path, siding with the Judaizers and their barbaric Yahweh deity. The schism now complete, Marcion would go on to found his own church using that first Bible, and it would grow to become the largest Christian denomination in the Roman Empire before being crippled and all but erased from the pages of history by a Damnatio Memoriae edict issued by Emperor Constantine shortly after the Council of Nicaea in 325 AD. Now, interestingly, the Marcionite Church and that first Christian Bible still exist today, and you can learn more about it at marcionitechurch.org, and you can also pick up a free copy of that Bible at, appropriately enough, theveryfirstbible.org. Now, of course, today, as we look at the depraved state of Western Judeo-Christian churches, we can see with our own eyes the bad fruit born of that corrupt tree rooted in Pius's poor decision. Remember, as Christians, we're compelled to seek the truth and hold fast to it. And that starts with understanding history as it really happened. And armed with that newfound knowledge, people around the world are reconnecting with the pre-Nicene faith and regaining their footing on solid theological ground and unedited, unalloyed scripture. Will you be among them? And by the way, St. Marcion's Feast Day will be celebrated on July 15th. To learn more about him and why July 15th is important, visit the link in the show notes or on the Marcionite Church page. If you enjoyed today's episode, please consider sharing it with friends and family. Thanks for listening. I'm Darren Kalama, and we'll see you next time on Pre-Nicene Perspective. <laughs>